Hey everyone, sorry about that. Uh, Bosco was supposed to be hosting and he dropped out as soon as we went live, so... <laughs> very sorry about that, but this is Jacobin Talks. Uh, this is a political education series from Jacobin Magazine. We do these talks uh, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays for about an hour. We talk to an important uh, thinker, writer, organizer on the left. Uh, today we have none other than... Which am I? <laughs> well, uh, you're a bit of a writer, uh, I don't know what you organize, actually, um, but you are the the Jacobin Europe editor. Um, here he is. Hey, got yeah, him back. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, everyone. Uh, you can hear me and stuff now, right? We can okay. hear you. Uh, yeah, yeah. I am. Uh, I'm working. Uh, I'm actually back at the Jacobin office, but I forgot my laptop today. But I found this like 2008 MacBook, uh, and I had to find a charger for it, and it barely works. So. Uh, anyway, apologies for the technical difficulties. Um, if you want, you know, give us some money in the super chat and we'll get better equipment. You know, David is like working from a cafe, I bet, somewhere nice in Europe. <laughs> no, I'm not uh, home. It's, uh, it's okay. Home. Yeah, yeah, you're, I know, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Um, David, when I first came to visit him in uh, in Rome, I was just utterly confused by the fact that he didn't have internet in his home. So we just got to go work from bars starting at like 11 a.m., which was um, a beautiful experience. But in any case, uh, David, has uh, did Kale introduce you a bit? Yes. Okay, well, that's David. You should also read his book. I'm sure Kale said that to you as well. But David was actually the first um, Marxist in a while to be positive reviewed by the FT for his latest book um, on the rise of the populist right in Italy. Uh, and today, though, he's talking about um, about Greece. He's talking about um, the Greek resistance to first Italian, uh, then Nazi uh, occupation. I guess a little bit of both, probably. Um, I guess the the, the Nazi gliders came in Crete and the Italians tried to take the rest of the country. But the only good thing one can say about Italian fascism is that they were fairly incompetent at war making. And uh, they were soon relieved by uh, German uh, forces. And David will be talking about that, that experience, the role of the communists and the resistance to Nazism. Uh, then uh, later, uh, how the seeds were, were sowed by the um, uh, for the Greek Civil War and the role that the British played in that. So it's a lot of really fascinating history. Uh, it's stuff that David knows because David knows everything. Uh, I told him that I wanted to do this on like 48 hours notice and he was completely up for it. So I'm looking forward to hearing his talk. And once again, as usual, <laughs> press lo uh, like, press subscribe, uh, support the channel. We're going to have a talk on Friday um, with uh, Matt uh, McManus and Ben Burgess on Marxism and liberalism. And on Saturday, we have another episode of Weekends with Anna and Nando. We're joined by guest Corey Robin. That's actually quite a striking photo of Corey Robin. He looks like a Hollywood star. But in fact, Corey Robin is a Jackman contributing editor and a professor of political science at Brooklyn College, um, not a Hollywood star. Uh, anyway, with all that said, <laughs> that all that necessary, uh, necessary, necessary thing said, I'll pass it off to David for his talk. Uh, please, if you have questions for David during his talk, uh, just uh, leave it in the chat and we'll get to it. Okay, um, well, thanks, Vasco, and uh, thanks everyone for uh, watching. Um, yes, yeah, so basically I'm going to talk a bit about why the uh, Greek resistance and Greek civil war was particularly important, 
then I'll sort of go through some of the history uh, and then uh, talk about the how it led to the beginnings of the Cold War. Um, I think uh, stop why it's interesting. Um, I think it's it's quite commonplace to to think about um, World War Two and the resistance movements in occupied Europe uh, in terms of the idea of kind of anti-fascist unity and and the sort of idealism uh, and a cause that uh, supposedly united uh, everyone uh, over and above sort of other political divides, above class conflicts and anything else. Um, so, you know, that's so partly present, of course, in the fact that the Soviet Union was allied with Britain and the United States. Uh, we see the same thing, for instance, uh, in the fact that you know uh, Britain had a coalition government of Labour and Tory throughout the war, uh, all in the national interest uh, against Germany. And similarly, most resistance movements across Europe were uh, national liberation committees that brought together all sorts of political forces, whether communists, Catholics, uh, liberals, whatever. Um, but, you know, that unity broke down after 1945, once the common enemy was removed, and then the, the different forces started resuming their political battles, and that led to the Cold War. Um, and what's interesting about Greece is in, uh, you could almost say in microcosm, or at least in a, a very small country, um, it provides a clear example of all those dynamics playing out actually right from the start of uh, the war and particularly from the start of the German occupation. Um, between 1941, uh, when the, the Germans uh, conquered uh, Greece, uh, to 1949, at uh, the end of the Civil War, uh, what we see is a constant uh, battle among the resistance forces and their uh, allied sponsors uh, in which uh, the fight against the Germans uh, often appears almost in the background of the story, uh, given the determination to uh, impose the post-war uh, political regime, and in the case of Britain, to restore a authoritarian and uh, royalist government, uh, basically regardless of the political composition of the resistance or the uh, democratic wishes of the Greek population. Um, so, um, and this is also interesting because, uh, uh, apart from having a very communist dominated resistance, uh, the uh, Greeks actually have one of the largest resistance movements in Europe. Um, the, the communist led resistance organization, uh, Elas had as much as half a million members, uh, even, and 80,000 of them armed, even in a country of only 7 million. And uh, this story has lots of instructive elements. Uh, so even apart from the, the role of the Communist Party and its relation to the Soviet Union, um, and Winston Churchill's rather strange version of anti-fascism, um, it's also interesting in, in, in the particular connection to Britain and the fact that the 1945 Labour government, usually considered the most socialist in British history, uh, pursued uh, the British imperial policy in treating uh, Greek anti-fascists, rather like colonial rebels. Okay, so um, going back to uh, before the war, um, Greeks' uh, small size and the weak influence of the left in its interwar politics uh, didn't give much reason to expect it was going to be a center of communist revolution, uh, despite its uh, sort of famous uh, and ancient traditions uh, modern Greece has uh, quite a weak uh, democratic politics in the interwar period. Uh, there were, uh, I think, a dozen uh, coups d'etat between uh, 1920 and 1935. And uh, after the 1936 elections, um, when there was no clear winner and the liberals could only have formed a government if they relied on communist support, um, the king introduced an authoritarian regime called the August 4th regime under General Metaxas, uh, which was uh, in all but name a, a fascist government in Greece, uh, despite its um, friendly ties to Britain and indeed the dominance of British commercial capital in uh, the Greek economy of the time. 
um, in the interwar period, the, the main parties had been uh, the Liberals um, behind uh, Eleftheros um, Venizelos, and then the Popular Party, who were monarchists in Greece at the time, uh, but from 1935 had uh, had a king. Um, the Communist Party um, had never had more than sort of five to ten percent of of um, electoral support, and, and wasn't really a sort of mass force in, in Greek uh, society. Um, part of the reason for this was that it um, supported um, Macedonian separatists and, and therefore was characterized as a kind of threat to the integrity of the, the Greek state. Um, but also Greece had pretty weak um, sort of trade union uh, traditions. There wasn't a, a sizable socialist or social democratic party either. Um, and uh, uh, because of Greece's small industrial working class, uh, basically, the party should have oriented towards the peasants and uh, didn't uh, until at least the start of the 1930s. Uh, in, the, in 1930, the Greek Communist Party only had one and a half thousand members. Uh, but after that point, it adopted a, a popular front policy, seeking alliance with uh, agrarian forces to become more a part of the peasantry. And uh, by 1936, uh, it uh, had about 17,000 members. And uh, in that year's general election, it uh, it with its small allies got six percent of the vote. So as I say, a, a pretty small force. Um, but um, although under the Metaxas regime, which led up to World War II, uh, the communists were um, unable to organize. Um, thousands of the members in, put in jail. Um, their paper banned. Strikes were banned. Um, the situation changed dramatically in uh, October 1940 when as part of the uh, sort of opening salvos of World War II and the fact that uh, it looked like Germany was going to win, uh, Italy got involved and from its base in Albania uh, invaded Greece. Um, General Metaxas uh, called on Greeks to resist, uh, but so too did the, uh, the um, Communist Party's leader, uh, Nikos uh, Zakariadis, uh, who was in prison, but he called on the communists to to build a struggle against the Italians, uh, and this like even before the Soviet Union was involved in the war, before there were resistance movements in most countries. Uh, as you can see on that map, uh, well, you can see on the map at least that Albania is to the north of Greece, and it was from there that the Italians uh, attacked at the end of October 1940. Um, however, the uh, the um, sort of um, successes they'd had in the Spanish Civil War and in Ethiopia over the last uh, three or four years didn't prove easily applicable to uh, the Greek theatre and in particular because it's mountainous and uh, in November at least uh, very cold. Um, so uh, the Italian invasion soon ran aground. And actually, by the start of 1941, the Greek uh, army led by uh, Metaxas uh, had started pushing back into uh, Albania, uh, at which point uh, Germany was forced to invade uh, on Italy's uh, behalf. So in April 41, basically Germany, the, you know, the Wehrmacht uh, swept through Greece in just a few weeks um, with pretty little uh, effective opposition. Um, this is also kind of important because it's a, a massive uh, diversion of um, German forces at a time when it perhaps could have been instead focused on uh, its uh, looming war against the Soviet Union. Um, anyway, so um, after the invasion, you know, that was the, the beginning of a, a three and a half year uh, occupation. Um, there's a pretty good book on, on this is Mark Mazur's. Um, it's called Inside Hitler's Greece, um, which which covers the occupation period. Um, so, um, you know, as as with uh, any <laughs> state in uh, Nazi occupied uh, Europe, uh, it was a devastating and uh, terrorizing regime. Uh, about half a million people died during the war, uh, even though Greece's population is only seven million, um, and also you know that includes. Um, mass starvation in the winter of 1941-1942. Um, and, and part of the reason for that, in fact, is that Greece wasn't seen as particularly strategically important by uh, 
uh, Germany. So apart from, uh, by the German leadership. Uh, so um, apart from a few strategic centers, um, most of the occupation of the country was left up to weaker minor German allies, uh, Italy and Bulgaria, uh, who were allowed to police the rest. Um, so, you know, by that I mean, you know, Greece wasn't a particularly important source of, of labor or industry for Germany or of recruits. Um, but right from the start of the occupation, there were some signs of resistance. Um, you may have seen um, he died earlier this year, uh, Manolis Glezos, uh, who was one of the last surviving uh, participants in the Greek resistance and still a prominent political figure. Um, so when he was still a young man on uh, 30th of May, 1941, uh, he and his friend uh, Apostolos Santos um, went up the Acropolis, you know, the ancient uh, capital, ancient center of Athens, and uh, tore down the swastika flag from the Acropolis. So uh, even at a moment when it looked like Germany was going to win the war and had just occupied Greece a month earlier, uh, there was at least some sign of uh, revolt. And um, even though um, the, the, um, the king fled the country, although Metaxas had died a few months previously in January 41, uh, the prime minister who followed him uh, killed himself. So while the country's sort of central political leadership uh, fled uh, or <laughs> in one way or another, um, the, the resistance that, that began to be built um, was totally centered on the Communist Party. Uh, in September, it created a National Liberation Front called EAM. And over the winter, it began to form uh, Maki uh, units. Uh, Maki is, uh, means brushland. And basically, it's like um, the idea of, of, of partisans who take to hills and mountains and, and uh, sort of secluded areas from which they launch attacks on, on more conventional troops. So from September 41, uh, the party started creating uh, these kind of units in, in, in the mountainous and inland areas of Greece. And uh, that became an armed force called Elas, led by uh, Aris Velokiotis. And uh, Elas, it's kind of, it sounds a bit like the, uh, so there he is. Uh, and uh, Elas sounds a bit like the Greek word for Greece, uh, Hellas. Uh, it also had a paramilitary unit called Opla, which is like the Greek word for weapons. Okay, so um, while the communists immediately began building an armed resistance, um, at first this was uh, not the majority uh, view or not what the majority of the, the Greek population or still less the now disbanded army uh, invested in. Um, instead, uh, monarchist and far-right circles prominent in the Metaxas regime uh, quickly became collaborators with the Germans in the so-called Hellenic state, uh, a sort of puppet regime akin to Vichy France. Uh, for his part, uh, King George II had departed for London together with his ministers, uh, but in Athens, uh, both kind of liberal and monarchist figures kind of hedged their bets between the two sides. Um, there's an interesting account by uh, Christopher Montague Woodhouse, who is the chief of the British military mission in Athens, uh, who said that basically uh, the the only thing these these figures were interested in was um, was countering uh, communism, and as he put it, they considered not the Germans but the communists the main danger. Um, so right from the start of the resistance, these kind of figures would characterize the communists as trying to dominate the resistance, uh, but it, they didn't try and counter that, um, that communist monopoly by trying to organize resistance movements of their own. Um, the KKE, uh, the Communist Party, uh, for its part, um, combined uh, the fight against the, the, the occupying troops, particularly the Italians, uh, with the building of what it called laocracia, uh, which um, kind of is like democracy, but people's democracy. And the idea is that as opposed to the sort of political elites of the interwar uh, Greek state, uh, it would instead, through the resistance and through the mobilization, uh, actually start to build a different kind of political order. So despite uh, being an underground resistance army, 
uh, it would try and create a, a better and deeper form of democracy. Um, so from autumn 1942, uh, as it began to liberate uh, villages uh, around Greece, uh, it would create these kind of systems like village assemblies, uh, popular courts, uh, food rationing uh, that would be sort of centrally administered. Um, and the idea here was that it would put um, sort of uh, ordinary rural people directly in control of their situation. Um, at the same time, uh, this was harnessed to a popular front strategy, which uh, outwardly at least was aimed at securing national unity against the Germans. Um, so they they tended to avoid sort of direct confrontations with, say, uh, the ecclesiastical hierarchy, uh, and they and they restrained uh, members of theirs who sought to mount uh, land occupations, uh, except in so far as those were also attacks on Nazi. Uh, collaborators specifically. Um, Elas was initially a creation of the KKE, but did involve figures from some other um, political movements into uh, its leadership. And an important figure there was uh, Stefanos Serafis, who was a colonel in the pre-war Greek military, but who became a partisan leader. Um, so, you know, like a conventional military officer who joined the guerrilla struggle. Um, while most of the army officers who had been um, discharged after the German uh, invasion uh, were reduced either to inactivity, uh, some uh, kind of minority involved got involved in sort of liberal, um, sort of critical circles, but which weren't sort of militarily active, uh, and then uh, about a thousand uh, headed across the Mediterranean with evacuated troops to Cairo. Um, but um, in uh, Seraphis's case, uh, he um, he turned to the underground uh, at first as part of a, a liberal group called uh, AAA. Uh, but in fact, uh, rather curiously, after being arrested by Elas by the by the communist-led uh, partisans, um, and one of the the figures he was arrested with being murdered uh, uh, or executed, <laughs> perhaps I should say. Um, they, um, he, he basically saw the kind of system that was, had been created in the communist run areas. He saw that their resistance struggle was much more real and effective uh, and disciplined than, than the liberals owned own. And then he uh, defected to their side, bringing also his military training and the men who was able to influence. The largest non-communist resistance movement, uh, EDES, uh, was led by uh, liberals as well, by uh, Napoleon Zervas, uh, who was a liberal kicked out of the army after a failed coup attempt in 1935. Uh, he'd begun uh, with an organization very critical of, of the exiled king and saying he shouldn't be allowed to come back. Uh, but already by March 1942, he had changed completely towards pro-monarchist positions uh, believing that this was what the British wanted. Uh, and you know, while the, the British uh, did work with both uh, Elas, partisans, and with Edes, uh, their logistical support was heavily focused on Edes. So BBC radio reports on feats like the destruction of uh, Gogol Podemos, which was a bridge. Uh, so it's like a bridge, a railway bridge connecting Athens to Thessaloniki, uh, the second biggest city. It was blown up by partisans from different units, but the BBC would only mention the uh, the involvement of monarchist ones. So to the outside world, it was as if the largest uh, resistance organization didn't exist, only the ones that were politically uh, more uh, pliable to, uh, to the British government, Churchill. Um, in fact, the, the, the British, um, right from the start of the conflict, were very aware of the need for them to find some sort of political solution that would avoid uh, Elas from ever being able to come close to actual political power and from the resistance and the kind of people's democracy I mentioned uh, actually coming to um, shape the, the government of, of Greece post-war. So even from the very early period of the resistance, even when it was unclear that, uh, that Britain or the Allies would win the war at all, 
uh, they made um, interventions designed to stop the communists ever coming to power. Um, so uh, local collaborationists under Janus um, Rallis, uh, who was who was prime minister of the the sort of German puppet uh, Hellenic state from April forty three, um, they actually were already then uh, in contact with representatives of Allied military intelligence um, to say something about what what those forces actually represented. Um, under the German occupation, uh, the uh, Rallis uh, created so-called security uh, battalions, which were basically a Greek military uh, or sort of paramilitary force, which repressed the resistance movement uh, in collaboration with the organs of the, of the German puppet regime. Um, so they conducted kind of raids in working class areas of Athens, uh, so-called cleanup operations, and they would, uh, where they would, round up and, and kill um, actual uh, partisans. Um, also in, in contact with, with British military intelligence were monarchist organizations like uh, the organization Key, like Greek for X, um, basically seeking to build up forces in advance for a uh, eventual, uh, you know, build up forces in advance to oppose an eventual communist coup as they saw it. Um, the communists were indeed gaining strength. Uh, and over the winter of 43-44, there were direct clashes between uh, communist and monarchist uh, partisans. Um, Ellis's strength in um, liberating um, territory uh, in formerly Italian-occupied areas, particularly after the collapse of Mussolini's regime in July 1943, um, meant that by the start of 1944, they could declare a kind of counter-state uh, known as the government of the mountains, um, which uh, whose poetic and beautiful name, uh, of course, uh, carries reference to the base it had in the partisan forces who were generally stronger in those areas, uh, kind of away from the main thoroughfares and cities. Um, and in April 1944, uh, this government, uh, which was uh, based on the political forces who made up Elas, um, organized elections in so-called Free Greece, um, which were, um, in fact, the first elections in Greek history in which women were allowed to vote. Um, so the vote basically took place in liberated regions, but there were also kind of there's also stuff like in Athens, the partisans would like go door to door, giving out ballot papers, and then come around a few hours later and collect them again. Uh, obviously, these were not uh, good conditions for a uh, democratic and fair and contested election, uh, given it took place in a country occupied by Nazi Germany. Uh, nonetheless, um, about uh, or as many as 1.8 million people voted. And the the gesture of holding the election was important in in the sense of giving a kind of sign of popular consent to the 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 national council, which which was now held to be effectively a provisional government uh, for Greece. Uh, the creation of this uh, government also stoked enthusiasm in Cairo. Cairo was important, uh, not only as a, as a big city directly across the Mediterranean, uh, indeed one which had a, a, a large Greek population already before the war, uh, but also because tens of thousands of Greek soldiers had been evacuated there in 1941. And this was basically the kind of center of the uh, intrigues uh, among exiles and the British in order to shape the, uh, their plans for the government of post-war Greece. Uh, in fact, there's a, a sharp uh, conflict between, uh, on the one hand, the, the forces actually building the resistance in Greece, uh, and then uh, the, the various plans for Greece's future in the Allied uh, leadership. Uh, so in April 1944, uh, in response to the creation of the, the so-called government of the mountains, uh, soldiers in Cairo passed a motion calling for the creation of a democratic government. And that was then delivered to the exiled king's ministers as a letter. Um, in response, the monarchist leaders arrested the so-called ringleaders, uh, in turn prompting a mutiny, which quickly spread across the, the soldiers in Cairo and also the, uh, the navy, the Greek navy stationed there. 
um, and uh, the British then crushed the mutiny and uh, there was a severe repression. So um, uh, according to Joël Fontaine, uh, between 15 and 1,000, sorry, between 15 and 20,000 um, Greek soldiers were sent from there to punishment camps in the desert in Libya, Sudan, and Eritrea. So about half of the Greek forces in Cairo who were meant to be sent to Italy were instead sent to punishment camps because they supported uh, the call for a democratic government for their country. Um, indeed, Churchill, who basically is the central operator, and indeed it really is Britain rather than the United States that's driving events here, um, Churchill didn't want the balance of forces in Greece itself to decide who took power next. Um, I just said that the strongest resistance force was Ellis, to put some figures on that. Um, by the start of 1944, Ellis had about 500,000 members, um, of whom about one in six were, were uh, actually armed partisans. Uh, the smaller liberal uh, groups, which enjoyed uh, much stronger uh, allied uh, logistical and financial support had like something like 10,000 between them. They were, they were vastly smaller and less militarily effective. Um, and in fact, as the, as the sort of tide of war started heading increasingly in the Allies' favour, uh, as it became increasingly clear that indeed the, the German uh, occupation of, of Greece was going to end, um, the Western Allies, in general, uh, started looking to create uh, provisional governments that would be able to assure a, a sort of smooth transfer of power, uh, maintaining order, even as the German occupation was replaced by the British or American or Russian or whatever. Um, so in um, the uh, an important sort of way of understanding that is in the January uh, 1943, uh, the Casablanca conference, which was um, de Gaulle, uh, Charles de Gaulle, uh, the free French leader, uh, Roosevelt and Churchill, it uh, established a policy of um, unconditional surrender, that the, the Axis powers would have to um, cease fighting with no kind of preconditions without being uh, necessarily allowed to hang on to power or, or anything like that. Yet in fact, already in uh, December 1942, uh, the Vichyite, uh, so German collaborationist rulers of French Algeria, had switched sides and, and joined the Allied side. And then in July 1943, uh, most of the Italian um, royalist establishment did the same. So the king, many of the fascist party leaders, uh, General Medaglia, uh, they uh, abandoned Mussolini in order to throw their lot in with the Allies. Um, and uh, they sealed an armistice and they eventually actually joined the, uh, the Allied side, so completely switching from one camp to the other. And this was very much the mood also of some monarchist conservative circles in Greece who uh, were perfectly willing to to, to move um, indistinctly from pro-German to pro-British uh, as the moment suited, but who were uh, stridently and consistently anti-communist. Um, so in uh, April 1944, uh, following the mutiny in Cairo, uh, the British uh, realized that the king's ministers, the ones who'd served under the Metaxas government, uh, were ill-suited to managing the situation. And Churchill uh, personally and directly, uh, without consulting any Greek figure or authority, uh, imposed a new prime minister for the provisional government, uh, Georges Papandreou. Um, Georges Papandreou, uh, the name may seem reminiscent. Uh, also, uh, that's actually not him. <laughs> but um, the, uh, <laughs> the uh, George uh, Paul Pandreou, uh, the name may be familiar also because his grandson was also Prime Minister of Greece uh, during the early years of the sort of post-2008 uh, bailout of Greece, uh, so who uh, implemented austerity in exchange for European loans uh, as leader of PASOK. Uh, this particular Papandreou, the, the grandfather, uh, Churchill presented him to the House of Commons as a popular social democrat. In fact, Papandreou had little base of his own. Uh, he'd been education minister in the 
the, uh, the start of the 1930s in a liberal government, uh, in which role he had um, issued a ban on all communists uh, teaching in public schools. So uh, he was tasked with, with forming a, a provisional government in uh, April 1944. Uh, for its part, uh, Elas and its sort of KKE uh, figures at the center of it had always sought to be part of a broad national unity government. Uh, both the French and Italian communist parties had made a similar move by this point, uh, consistent with the wider grand alliance between the Western allies and the USSR, and the idea of mobilizing all possible forces against fascism. Uh, so if many militants who had seen people's democracy at work in liberated regions might have thought, well, the party is so strong that surely it can seize power nationwide, uh, Keiki leaders like Georgios uh, Siantos and Petros Roussos, uh, who were uh, respectively the uh, interior minister and foreign minister in the, in the government of the mountains, uh, they they were well aware that while they might be able to seize power by force, they probably wouldn't be able to hold on to it faced with uh, direct um, British uh, opposition. Um, and so they sort of maintained an uneasy balance between two different strategies, one of which was basically to continue building up their um, popular and political support uh, in liberated areas, then the other of which was to sort of gradually legitimize themselves in the eyes of the British by joining a, a unity government. Um, the problem was, what conditions could this take place under? And indeed, could they be in government while also building up their, their forces as a, as a, as a, a, a military power, as a, as a, as a, a partisan force? Uh, and it very quickly became clear that they would not be able to. Uh, a conference held in Lebanon under British auspices in May uh, 1944 included all uh, equal representation of all parties in Greece, from communists to the far right, uh, the so-called Noah's Ark. And this was regardless of their role in the resistance, or in fact whether they'd collaborated with the Nazis or not. Uh, Pape Andreu refused to begin the proceedings until Elas representatives had first condemned the mutinies in Cairo. This was very reluctantly granted, uh, appalling the mutineers themselves, uh, uh, but Pape Andreu nonetheless used the conference as a platform to denounce the partisans, uh, insisting, and he, he, he openly stated that they were on an equal footing because the, the partisans, just like the Germans, were destroying and burning the country and killing people. Uh, and he, he said that the main threat to Greece was not uh, the current German occupation, but rather a future, future civil war. And uh, he went on, and uh, we've got, I think we have a picture of this quote. Um, it would be a betrayal of the peoples who've fallen victim to tyranny if the Allies stopped at ensuring the expulsion of the Germans then abandoned them to whatever local for armed force imposed its tyranny. Only after the re-establishment of national sovereignty and political freedom will foreigners have the right and duty not to interfere in nations' internal affairs. What he meant by that was the Germans can't leave just for the communists to take over just because they happen to be the biggest resistance force. Rather, the British have to be brought into the country's politics Britain should directly and militarily intervene in Greece in order to disarm the partisans, in order to allow democracy to uh, go ahead. Uh, Elas representatives, who were the dominant and in fact almost only resistance force in Greece, were naturally appalled by this and the uh, insistence which went along with it that, the, that Elas should immediately dissolve uh, its uh, armed forces. Uh, basically, Papandreou said, well, uh, you only have 30,000 troops, whereas we want to build an army of 200,000. Uh, but <laughs> really what he was saying was that even under the German occupation, they should basically abandon all their weaponry, and then at some future point, perhaps they would be integrated into the national army. Um, what the, the solution briefly uh, found was a kind of fudge, 
where Elas would continue to exist, um, and the and uh, the AM, the, the 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 sort of political wing linked to it, would take up six of twenty four posts in a national unity government. This uh, fact of, of entering the government um, in exchange for such concessions um, marked at the beginning of a long series of retreats for Ellis. It was never quite brought to the moment of outright confrontation with the British and uh, the smaller uh, sort of centre-left parties in, in the coalition were always seeking to avoid any kind of firm split. Um, it was better to, to follow the principle of a national unity government uh, than, um, than put up kind of vetoes or anathemas. Um, the problem was the intention on the part of the British in bringing the uh, communists into the government was purely in order to discipline and disarm them. Uh, in summer, the Greek uh, government was transferred closer to the center of uh, allied operations in southern Italy, uh, and sort of away from uh, Cairo. And at the end of September, an agreement was reached uh, that all armed forces should be subject to the national government politically. Uh, this power was in turn then delegated by Papandreou to, uh, uh, to uh, Ronald Scobie, a British Lieutenant General. So taken out not only of, sort of any sort of democratic control, but, but literally handed to the British. Ellis perceived this, of course, as a defeat to accept the principle that a British Lieutenant General should be in charge of all resistance forces. But a major reason for this was the, their own lack of outside support, the fact that they couldn't rely on uh, a sort of foreign protector of their own in the way that the Liberals or Monarchists could. Um, Roussos, the uh, the KK uh, interior minister of the of the uh, government of the mountains, so his foreign minister, uh, he made he did try to make contact with the Soviet foreign minister Vyacheslav Molotov. Uh, there were very few direct connect, uh, relations between the the Soviet leadership and the Greek uh, communist leadership, uh, so he did this via the Bulgarians, and he got a very curt response, which was, "Whatever problems you create, you have to solve." Um, in short, the Soviet Union did nothing to stand up for support uh, the Greek Communist Party in any way and entirely washed its hands of the problem right from the outset. Um, this was well illustrated by the Moscow Conference that began on 9th of October 1944, uh, attended by Stalin and Churchill. And this uh, was the site of the famous Percentages Agreement. Uh, the Percentages Agreement was basically that uh, they, uh, Churchill wrote on a piece of paper uh, that Britain should have the dominant uh, share in the uh, future affairs of Greece, whereas the Soviet Union should do so in Poland, Bulgaria and Romania, and then Hungary and Yugoslavia should be 50-50. And Stalin uh, was, he, Churchill handed, this is how Churchill tells it, Churchill uh, handed Stalin the piece of paper and Stalin put a big tick on it. So some historians, of course, doubt that this uh, neat little story is really what was the driving force of history. Um, but what is true is that the Soviet Union really had no interest in Greece. It had no territorial presence there. Um, it was and had been uh, uh, under British hegemony for uh, almost uh, 150 years. Uh, well, I'm sorry, a bit more like 120. And um, and basically, um, from Stalin's point of view, it was far better to make a big show of non-interference in Greece in order that he, in turn, could have a free hand in Poland, which was much more uh, of interest for his own foreign policy. Uh, of course, the, the cruelty of that is that, you know, whereas Poland had a very small uh, communist element to its resistance and weak popular support for the communists, uh, but the uh, Soviets, nonetheless, uh, were able to effectively impose themselves uh, in Greece. Everything went the other way around. And on October the 12th, the Soviet troops 
um, which were heading through Romania and Bulgaria, uh, stopped at the Greek border. They showed that they were not going to interfere. Um, October the 12th was also the day that the Germans abandoned Athens. Uh, there was no direct sort of military, you know, there was no direct fighting between the British and the Germans uh, over uh, Athens. Uh, there were there were um, there were sort of attempts by the Germans to sort of mine the the, the port and thereby destroy it, and, and uh, some of the LS uh, resistance uh, fighters managed to stop that taking place. Um, but um, Papandreou, um, and of course, you know the the liberation of the of the capital, um, despite everything that had gone on was a sort of festive occasion with, with huge demonstrations and so on. And uh, if you, you read the, the testimony of figures like Manolis Glezos, who I mentioned earlier, um, you know, they, they have this problem, which is like, how can the Communist Party stand against the popular enthusiasm for the British, who are after all seen as, as liberators? Um, but what was already in train was the move by the British, by Papandreou, to start crushing the Greek Communist Party, despite its uh, role in the resistance. Um, so you know, in previous months, uh, KK General Secretary Georgia Santos, uh, Santos had uh, sort of assured uh, the sort of doubtful members that, well, you know, even if the party um, couldn't seize power at force, by force, its real strength was popular and political. The, the strength it had built up in the liberated regions through its so-called people's democracy, and that really it just needed to wait for for elections and the political process, and it would be able to to show that uh, support. The problem is is that uh, already by this point, uh, British troops were flooding into the country. Um, so while at the actual moment of the liberation of Athens, there were only about twenty thousand. Um, British troops in Greece in uh, mid-October of 1944. Uh, by December, that number had uh, risen to 75,000. So even after the Wehrmacht had left, and therefore the sort of Axis military threat had disappeared, um, the British continued to send troops from Italy, where the war was still going on, into Greece in order to um, ensure that the uh, the uh, government would be able to maintain control against a sort of imaginary and possible um, communist uprising. And at the start of December, uh, Roland Scobie, who had been uh, appointed the, sorry, Ronald Scobie, who had been uh, appointed the, uh, the, the sort of, um, who's the British military uh, chief in charge of the, um, all of the armed forces in Greece, uh, he announced that Elas must immediately hand in its weapons. Uh, this was a unilateral order, uh, which didn't apply either to monarchists or to collaborationist forces. Uh, in fact, many of these latter, and even some of those who had been in prison, uh, now began to reorganize under uh, a figure uh, called Charles Wickham, um, who um, had who previously uh, in the Irish Civil War, um, sorry, in the Irish War of Independence is what I mean, had been decisive in organising the uh, RUC, Royal Ulster Constabulary, and of merging uh, paramilitary and police forces. And he now began to build a paramilitary police force in Greece. Okay, so, um, so we're coming to the end of the story. Um, when Scobie announced the dissolution of Elas, that it would have to hand in all his weapons, uh, the uh, Elas, um, uh, its political wing, um, its ministers resigned from the Papandreou government and called a massive demonstration in Athens for December the 3rd. So um, it's uh, very nearly the 70, well, it's the 76th anniversary tomorrow. There you go. Um, and so 200,000 people demonstrated in Athens against the breaking up of Alice's armed forces. Uh, but the police opened fire on the crowd uh, 
uh, killing 28 people. And actually, as the fighting spread from uh, Syntagma Square, kind of around Athens and to the, to the peripheral working class districts, uh, British troops actually began to use artillery and also aerial bombardment. Um, and this uh, is the this is an event called the Decembriana, which is uh, a month, a week, and a day of, uh, of fighting between first Elas and the Greek government, uh, and then uh, coming to include direct military clashes with British troops themselves. Um, and uh, telling in this regard, uh, and what the British policy was, was uh, a very famous quote, uh, which you see in all histories of this period by Winston Churchill, uh, what he said to Scobie on the morning of uh, 5th of December. So telling him, you're responsible for maintaining order in Athens, for neutralizing or destroying all Elas bands approaching the city. You may make any regulations you like for the strict control of the streets or rounding up any number of persons, truculent persons. It would be well, of course, if your command were reinforced by the authority of some Greek government. Do not, however, hesitate to act as if you were in a conquered city where a local rebellion is in progress. So uh, that's, uh, of course, a, a chilling uh, quote. And it's also remarkable if we think of you know, what we, how we imagine or how we commonly think about Britain's role in fighting fascism in World War II. And yet in this case, the biggest and central national resistance movement, which had done most to fight against Nazi Germany, um, was directly fired upon by British troops. Uh, and uh, indeed, there was more than a, a month of, of fighting. Um, this uh, situation also did draw... Um, um, did spark um, sort of serious political controversy in both Britain and the United States. In fact, despite Greece being a small country, there's probably no other sort of post-war transfer of power where it was so, uh, which, which um, sort of drove such political discussion in, in Britain as the situation in Greece. Um, but the <laughs> also must be said that the uh, Labour Party, uh, which was then in coalition government with the Tories, uh, showed itself uh, singularly uh, spineless uh, on this issue. And in fact, uh, Ernest Bevan, who was um, foreign minister in the, uh, the, the sort of post 1945 uh, Labour government, sort of chose this moment uh, in which to assert that the Labour Party would be a, a solid defender of the imperial interest and that it wouldn't uh, see the, the British flag lowered from uh, Athens. Okay, so um, I mean, we can, I guess we can go on to maybe discuss more um, what led the communists to this disaster. And, and there were also those who, who sort of criticized the party for not adopting a, a more sort of all out struggle for power. Um, but I, I, what I hope to, to show is that the, the sort of conflict within the resistance and the British attempt to uh, combat the communist influence had begun very early in the war. And uh, that indeed is what uh, led to the, the protracted uh, civil war that uh, followed in, in the years after the actual end of World War II. So, so essentially the British government helped create a situation in which there could be no actual nas true national unity government that incorporated the, the, the communists. They kind of drove them to this, um, this position. Uh, because essentially it was the will of the Communist Party and also, you know, the intentions of Stalin and the so Soviets too for um, not necessarily an immediate revolution in Greece, but for the constitution of some sort of national democratic republic in which communists had uh, some sort of... Yeah, that's of right. Important I mean, in, um, in the um, uh, communist paper, uh, Razum Patsis, um the uh, leaders like Rousseau actually even kind of actually directly said, you know, we could have seized power by force. That was sort of within our like military capabilities, but we didn't seek to do that. We sought to lay the basis for, you know, democratic elections and, and so on. 
uh, but in fact the drive to um, the drive to disarm the partisans even before the war was over uh, would sort of break any possibility of 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 unity of that kind. Uh, in fact, after the end of the fighting I mentioned in um, January uh, January 1945, uh, there was a treaty signed whereby all of the paramilitary groups uh, agreed to um, lay down weapons at the same time, uh, a massive political defeat for Ellis. Uh, but then the, that only unleashed a kind of white terror against them in which thousands of people were killed. And that's why they were eventually forced back to the mountains in '46. So, I think the the problem that the Communist Party had is, at once, they were aware that they couldn't rule in open defiance of the British, and that basically the Soviet Union wasn't going to do anything to help them, uh, and they couldn't sort of rely on like a Soviet invasion or something like that to help them out. Uh, but at the same time, they, there was really no opening for them in the institutional game that uh, Churchill was uh, was promoting. Well, uh, well, essentially, Stalin wanted obviously this this buffer zone in the east for obvious reasons. Um, whatever we think of of <laughs> Stalin, <laughs> but um, you know he had just been invaded. Um, there was none of this buffer zone in Eastern Europe. And that meant that Soviet foreign policy was a lot more conservative than a lot of people in the West thought. He wasn't trying to expand radically across Europe, in Italy, um, in Greece. There was a lot of conservatism in the, in the, foreign policy approach of the Soviets. And the only reason why the communists took power in Albania and Yugoslavia is that they took power by by force. But when the civil war begins and the Greek partisans are, are fighting, uh, can you just get into the stance of Tito and the Yugoslav partisans, and I guess to some degree, Hozier too, and how everything was impacted by the um, Tito-Stalin. Mm -hmm. So part of the problem is that in, um, there's a quite interesting book, um, which I think we have a photo of, it's called um, How the How and Why the People's Liberation Struggle of Greece Met with Defeat. This is by uh, Svetos, uh, uh, Kukman, uh Vukmanovic, sorry, who was a uh, Yugoslav representative in Greece from uh, 43 onwards. And basically, all, the reason that book is written in 1949 is that after the war, uh, the Soviet U leadership tries to blame the Yugoslavs for, uh, for the failure in Greece, for the defeat, the fact that Basically, Yugoslavia didn't commit more to helping the Greeks out. Um, th the problem with this uh, analysis is it is certainly true that uh, throughout 44, Tito often kind of encouraged the KKE um, to try and follow the Yugoslav example more closely, which was in, in effect to... to um, build up their own state and, and seize power by force. Uh, yet at the same time, uh, Tito was very wary of giving any kind of pretext for Britain to intervene in Yugoslavia itself. Um, there was also the problem that um, because of ethnic cleansing in uh, in Greece, um, there was uh, there were a lot of refugees who moved across the border into what is now. Uh, Macedonia, and there was this kind of uh, accusation that um, that um, because of the concentration of Macedonians there, that they would try and the partisans there might try and uh, cross over back over into the back over the Greek border. So Tito was very uh, keen to avoid giving any impression of like interference or provocation. Uh, it, should, it should also be said that um, the British uh, were much less interested in Yugoslavia than Greece and did almost nothing uh, similar to try and influence uh, 
uh, its government, also because uh, Yugoslavia was more finely balanced between Britain and uh, the Soviet Union. Um, so in the Civil War period, um, Yugoslavia did provide uh, direct military aid to the Greeks in um, to the Greek communists uh, from forty six onwards. Of course, when Tito's own government was much more firmly established than it had been during World War Two. Um, but uh, the problem was that uh, the uh, I mean, very schematically is that the as the Tito Stalin split was developing, uh, the Greek. Uh, communists chose uh, Stalin's side under their leader um, um, Zakariadis um, and Tito um, shut off uh, aid at the start of uh, 49. Um, so while uh, the the um, um, you know they didn't want, the Greek communists didn't want to be on what was obviously going to be the losing side in the Tito Stalin split, um, but at the same time, that meant giving up on the uh, the force that was actually uh, helping them. Uh, of course, from um, March 1947, uh, the dominant um, external intervention in the Greek Civil War was from the United States, thanks to the Truman Doctrine, uh, which is uh, you know c can be seen as the beginning of the Cold War in the sense it commits the United States to militarily aiding any country uh, facing a so-called communist threat. Uh, although, as I've said, in in reality, that was more a matter of the Americans taking over uh, leadership of the anti-communist struggle uh, from the British. So, can you talk a bit about just just to uh, wrap up? Um the grounds on which uh, the impact, I guess, of the the civil war, the impact of this of this on the development of Greek um, democracy, and then also its legacy on the left, like how it's looked back upon today. So obviously, Greece had two coups, one in the '60s and one in '73. I don't know what year in the '60s, '67. Um, yeah, um, and obviously had their their um, kind of colonel regime, like a very um, brutal and bloody um uh junta um and um yeah so one how is it looked back to po back upon um uh today within the greek left is it just something remembered by the communists and more generally what impact did this have on on the development of not just the greek left but uh greek mm -hmm. uh modern well, democracy um greece from world war ii uh even before the colonel's regime of 67 to 74, you know, even in the 50s and 60s, it was a democracy in a sense, but at the same time, the Communist Party was suppressed and had to work through a legal front called uh, EDA. Um, and, you know, the, the end of the, you know, the civil war from 46 to 49 uh, led, you know, forced tens of thousands of people into uh, exile, thousands killed. Um, there were people in prison even in the 70s who, whose only crime was to have fought the Nazis. Um, so um, the you know in, in in many European countries at least the effect of occupation and then resistance had been that uh, reactionary ruling class elements were removed from power, uh, maybe even like physically eliminated, uh, and anti-fascism, uh, even if not in government, had at least some sort of uh, social recognition and standing and support. Uh, whereas in Greece, instead, uh, the resistance was uh, sort of unanimously condemned as a communist uh, coup attempt. Um, so um, the the effect of that is, you know, that um, so far right paramilitaries and fascist elements had an over uh, and sort of had a, had a continuing and overbearing uh, weight in the post-war state, were not purged. Uh, and in fact, uh, another effect of the British uh, involvement was the uh, oversized uh, Greek uh, military, which swelled enormously after World War II. Uh, and obviously, the, the, both the strength of, of the military and security services and the fascist elements therein have continued to play a role throughout Greek history up till now. Um, the the fact of, of being um, clandestine, even after the war, 
uh, had an effect on the on the on the left, and also in the sense that the communists had to operate through fronts, which like uh, like Edo, which grew uh, grew um, sort of um, autonomous from the party itself, and later there was the split between uh, Euro communists and then the KKE, uh, uh, as it's still called, uh, which is one of the most sort of hardline Marxist Leninist uh, communist parties that still exist. Um, I think the the particular choices of the KKE uh, leadership um, from that period aren't necessarily like the something that the left uh, or the, at least the non KKE left looks back on particularly um, affectionately. But but nonetheless, the the facts of the of the repression and the continuing fascist presence in its life means means that sort of anti fascism is still. Um, is still very prominent. Um, I mean, you know, even when um, even when Tsipras was first elected in 2015, he sort of invoked the idea of the of the resistance and the fact that it uh, so that Greece had never been fully uh, sovereign. Um, at the same time, I think one thing I, I kind of didn't touch on, which which is interesting to note, is that um, some of the um, although it although there wasn't kind of a, a confrontation between different ideas of the KKE struggle during the, the resistance. Uh, it did kind of splinter uh, during the Civil War. So even some of its main military leaders, like, um, for example, um, uh, Marcos Rafiadis, uh, who was the leader of the, of the, the sort of communist forces during the, the, the Civil War, uh, the, the Civil War post-war, um, or um, the uh, the uh, Elas um, uh, leaders as well, you know, after the after the defeat in forty four, uh, they tend to, to take a more critical approach towards uh, the sort of main party uh, sort of political leadership. Um, and there's a book called uh, uh, "The Capitanos" by Dominique uh, Udes, Um from from the seventies, and that that's quite an interesting uh, work in in terms of showing uh, the mismatch between the the communist party's sort of formal political strategy uh, and then the the approach taken by by some of the uh, military leaders. Uh, there's also another book um, more recently uh, by Harris Lovianos called uh, Greece, nineteen forty one to forty nine. Uh, and and that's really useful for for understanding the, the debates within the the communist um, communist leadership of the time. Well, um, that was great, David. And for everyone watching, um, David is doing this at one a.m. Uh, his time, uh, so it's deeply appreciated. Uh, David is the Europe editor of Jackman. You should read his book, and you should press like and subscribe, and tune in for another. Jackman Talk this Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern, and we'll be talking about uh, the relationship between uh, Marxism and liberalism uh, with Matt McManus and Ben Burgess. So thanks to everyone for watching. Uh, thanks especially once again to David, to Kale, um, who's behind the scenes, and I'll see you guys sometime soon. Thank mm -hmm. you.